Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another live at the Social Impact Conference. My name is Alyssa Gandini. Um, I'm going to be your interviewer for today, and I'm going to introduce this live to you guys. So I am a Brazilian filmmaker and also gender equality activist. And um, today, um, the Social Impact Pro um, Conference is producing a series of lives with some of the most important experts in the world to raise funds for international organizations, NGOs, and social projects that are helping vulnerable populations during the COVID-19 pandemic. Tonight, uh, we'll be talking about, well, actually this afternoon, right? <laughs> we'll be talking about human rights in COVID-19. As COVID continues to be a pandemic worldwide, we know that this global health crisis has already harmed people's human rights. So the live will raise funds today um, to the Red Cross, one of the biggest humanitarian organizations in the world. As a humanitarian organization and member of the broader health community, the Red Cross has adapted their services to help meet the needs of this extraordinary uh, time and have been helping thousands of vulnerable people around the world with free, quality, and safe health services. The participants for this live will be um, Raisan Gupta, Natalia Brigagão, and Rosa Celorio. So, um, Rai is a development consultant and youth speaker based in India. She recently evaluated a maternal and child cash transfer program in Myanmar and be on behalf of UNICEF and the Department for International Development's Portfolio of Aid in Zimbabwe. In her latest assignment, she supports the prim primary policy making arm of the Government of India and ITI, IOG in evaluating programs in India's rural development sector, including the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, the largest public works program in the, in the world. Um, Rai previously interned with Amnesty International India and helped conceptualize a nationwide campaign to seek justice for the 1984 Sikh massacre in India. A passionate public speaker, Rai has spoken on human rights, youth action, and sustainable development at the 30 plus institutions in her city, New Delhi, reaching out to 7,000 students. Our second inter, um, inter person to be interviewed to this um, afternoon is Natalia Brigadão. Um, she's a fellow Brazilian human rights advocate and the founder and coordinator of the IDESCA Initiative for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights of the Human Rights Lab, Brazil. Uh, an incoming Magister Juris Candidate and Weidenfeld Hoffman Coffee Annan Scholar at the University of Oxford, um, the class of 2020-21. She was previously a visiting student at Harvard University and holds uh, LLB, so a Laws Bachelor, for the, from the Federal University of Uberlândia. She formerly acted as an advisor to the Mission of Brazil to the United Nations in New York on human rights and social matters. Currently, she contributes to the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker and to the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Professor Oliver the Shooter, with whom she interns. Author of several articles and book chapters on human dignity and human rights, Natalia has also developed research for official reports of the Special Reportership on Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and was an invited lecturer to the most renowned human rights course in South America. She speaks in personal capacity. Our last person to be interviewed today is Rosa Silorio. She currently works as Associate Dean for International and Comparative Legal Studies and Burnett Family Professional professional lecturer in international and comparative law and policy at the George Washington University Law School in Washington, DC in the US. She also teaches courses related to regional protection of human rights, the rights of women and the US legal system and public scholarship in these areas. Previously, she worked for more than a decade as senior attorney for the Inter-American Commission in Human Rights one of the main organs of the regional human rights protection system for the Americas. In this capacity, she had various leadership positions, including the supervision of all the legal work performed by the, by the specialized reporterships on women, indigenous people, racial discrimination, children, and older persons, among other, others. She has also acted as an advisor and consultant for several United Nations agencies. She's originally from Puerto Rico. 
Um, so after this live is concluded, we'll have some time for questions from the audience. And please feel free to submit those on the comments. And um, I hope you guys enjoy the live. I'm going to start with the first um, question and I'm going to start with um, Rosa. So um, Rosa, what do you think um, that are the main impacts on uh, human rights? Thank you so much for that question, Elisa. And it's absolutely wonderful to be participating in this live. I just want to say hello to all of you that are connected. And I also want to say how lucky I feel uh, to be participating in this live with Elisa, with Natalia, with Rai, which are these wonderful women that are doing a lot of work in the area of human rights and are also trying to address these connections between COVID and human rights. As Elisa mentioned, um, when we're talking about COVID, we're talking about a pandemic of epic proportions and the numbers speak for themselves. We're talking about more than 8 million persons infected worldwide. We're talking about close to 500,000 deaths worldwide. And aside from the effects um, and the deaths, which are unspeakable tragedies when it comes to COVID, we're also talking about a radical change of life. Um, we are talking about the closing of the governments as we know them, of schools, of businesses, all orders of shelters in place, curfews, and other kinds of state restrictions that have been necessary and that a lot of states have been adopting in order to prevent and basically contain um, the spread of COVID-19. And I think what's very important to remember when you think of human rights and COVID-19 is that COVID is not only a health issue, but it also has a lot of human rights repercussions, not only COVID itself, but also the restrictions and a lot of the activities and the change of life that we have been seeing has a very unique and specific impact on our populations. I always like um, when I talk about COVID to think about what does it mean for a state to have human rights obligations? And human rights obligations um, are continuous for a state, even in times of emergency, even in times of crisis. States can restrict, they can restrict human rights, especially when they have an adequate justification, when, when they have um, objectives that are founded in necessity, in proportionality, in legality, and also temporality. But at the end of the day, the human rights obligations are still there and the actions of the states have to be justified. And there's a lot of cornerstone human rights obligations that we always speak of that are always um, applicable to states, even in times like this, even in times of crisis, even in times of emergency, um, even in times of pandemic. I'm talking about the right to be free from discrimination and violence, the duty to protect the rights to life, personal integrity and privacy of persons. I'm talking about access to justice. I'm talking about this obligation of states to really be mindful of the impact of its policies and pandemics and emergencies on specific groups of the population that are at risk. And I'm also talking about this perspective of human dignity, of thinking mm -hmm. about the ethno and racial impact of policies, the gender impact of policies, the intersectional impact of policies. These are all continuous obligations that states have that continue even in times of emergency. In terms of the impact of COVID on human rights, I wanna highlight some in particular that I think are very important. One of them is the restrictions issue. The fact when we have orders of shelters in place, when we have the closing of businesses, of schools, or social distancing measures, um, restrictions in our mobility and in our interactions, all of this has to be guided by the principles of necessity, proportionality, legality, and temporality. And it does have to be balanced also with this overarching obligation the states have to protect the population from the spread of the COVID pandemic. Um, definitely access to health services and the safeguard of that access um, and the accessibility and affordability and quality of those health services are very important, especially when it comes to vulnerable populations like the elderly, um, racial populations and racial minorities and also gender specific populations, not only women, but also persons affected um, affected um, by COVID for many reasons based on gender considerations um, and other groups of the population. This is all very important uh, for states to continue being mindful of. I think access to information is a big one. 
at the end of the day also when it comes to COVID-19 that yes. there is a safeguard, yeah, that there's a safeguard of an adequate and also credible information and also information uh, founded on scientific evidence of what's happening with COVID in terms of statistics, but also of all, you know, this, this resources and services that are available to the population when they're affected. We're also talking about the rights of patients themselves to their privacy, to their integrity, to their confidentiality, and to adequate access to health services. Um, at the end of the day, also, we're talking about protections of freedom of expression, freedom of association, journalists, human rights defenders, um, and protesters, all of those that are trying to voice in the population um, things that may be going better or could be going better when it comes to these restrictive restrictions. And, and I would like to close um, because we, we will have more time to talk about how important it is to um, always be mindful of the specific effect or the intensification of human rights violations that specific groups of the population can face when you have a problem like COVID-19. And there I'm talking about women, I'm talking about Afro-descending communities, I'm talking about indigenous peoples, I'm talking about elderly persons, migrants, um, and many others that have been very affected, not only by COVID-19, but also the numbers in terms of deaths, but also numerous barriers to access health services, to access information, and to access the resources that they need at this particular juncture. I'm gonna stop there because I think we'll have more time to discuss, but thank you again. Um, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Rosa. It seems that um, it's been very difficult um, for a lot of governments to actually take care of these populations. Um, I'm going to move with the same question um, to Ryan. Right now, so um, Ryan, what do you think um, are the main impacts of COVID nineteen pandemic on human rights? Maybe um, something that Rosa said, um, something that you want to add up. I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I completely agree with whatever Professor Salerio mentioned in terms of the human rights implications, whether it be to specific vulnerable pockets of people, whether it be in terms of access or in terms of the rights that are sort of taken away by states by way of restrictions. So I'm completely on board with what she said. And if we have to talk about specific groups of people, and if I have to talk about uh, what I've witnessed around in my own country, which uh, underwent the largest lockdown in history, so to speak, and we're still undergoing varying stages of it, then I would like to definitely point out the ways in which it has affected vulnerable populations in particular, in very, very specific, very, very determined ways, right? Uh, you know, on 24th March, our country went into lockdown and we are currently on day 89 of sorts. And uh, we're talking about, you know, 133 crore people. We're talking about like 1.3 billion people in lockdown. And obviously we have a diversity of vulnerabilities, a diversity of, uh, you know, problems and socioeconomic barriers that are faced by various sections of society. And history has shown us that while the most conventional response to a pandemic is a lockdown, uh, it generally affects certain populations much more. Populations who may have to be physically present at their work sites to be able to get their jobs done, who cannot work remotely, or populations who are low skilled and therefore cannot sort of restart their livelihoods in case there is a lockdown and their jobs are taken away, or populations that don't have savings or don't have credit, or therefore you know are unable to sustain themselves in the case that their income sort of dries up. And that has been the case across the world, wherein there is job loss, there is economy shrinking, and in particular, very uh, fundamentally, certain vulnerable groups, uh, for instance, the elderly, for instance, women uh, who are, let's say, stuck at home with abusive husbands or facing domestic abuse, for instance, certain indigenous people whose access to forest produce or whose access to markets has been ruined by the pandemic, or in, in my own country's case, the case of migrant workers, wherein after the imposition of the lockdown, uh, hundreds of thousands of them had to travel often by foot or by you know bicycle or by various means back home because all public transport was stopped uh, making it one of the largest exoduses in history so it again de depends upon the various socioeconomic barriers and the various socioeconomic challenges that are faced by a particular group and that in turn determines their access to services their access to rights their ability to exercise their rights but broadly, it is the poor who've paid the most disproportionate cost of this disease, as with any other, you know, uh, global challenge. The poor are the at the you know the ones that are facing a very significant portion of 
uh, the negative consequences of this. And you know, a recent study that was conducted in New Delhi across 18,000 households showed that about 60% of uh, about like of the poor households among them, and all of them are poor households. 60% of them had lost all their income, and 20% did not have uh, yeah money and supplies uh, for the coming few weeks. So it just goes to show that, of course, a lockdown is important. Of course, a lockdown is necessary. But the kind of impacts it can have in terms of immediate survival and eventual survival are very far reaching. And that's when human rights comes in. That's when the right to uh, a dignified life comes into play, because that is clearly being denied in this case. So as, Dr. Uh, as Professor uh, clearly pointed out, absolutely, the vulnerabilities determine our access to rights and also our ability to exercise them. And it's very important for states to recognize that when they impose a lockdown and also when they reopen the economy, so to speak. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm going to um, lastly get the word to Natalia. So um, Natalia, if you could tell us uh, what do you think are the main impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on human rights? You can uh, maybe say some examples you might see in your own country or anything you might want to add up. First of all, I want to thank you for this invitation. It's an honor to be here learning from all of you and, and talking about this, uh, this issue that is so important. I completely agree with Professor Rosa and Rai. I think that what COVID has done is pretty much expose our collective failure in guaranteeing equal rights and dignity for everyone. I think that it took systemic inequalities and it took existing human rights violations and amplified it, uh, it amplified them by a hundred, by a thousand, and laid them bare for everyone to see. So, for example, in Brazil, where almost half of our population lives without sanitation, cases keep rising. People in poverty are falling ill because they have to work even in unsafe conditions to put food on their tables. And if they live in the Amazon region, for example, they are 13 times more likely to die from COVID than if they live south because of a complete lack of healthcare infrastructure. On the other hand, if these people are black and living in Sao Paulo, they are almost four times more likely to die than if they were white. So I don't think that it was COVID alone who, that brought us to that situation. I think that uh, these pre-existing conditions made this crisis what it is. It was the results of austerity measures, it was systemic racism, it was gender inequality, it was lack of quality housing, lack of health care, uh, and lack of an adequate standing standard of living in general. Um, so I think that's something we need to reflect on. The more vulnerable we were before the pandemic, the more vulnerable we are now. And I think that the irony of all of this is that many of these groups who we treat with disregard for their rights, for example, women and for example, underpaid workers in essential sectors are actually the people who are getting us through this pandemic right now. They are the people who are producing and delivering our food. They are the people who are cleaning our public spaces. They are the yes. people that are uh, caring for the sick, for older persons, for children who are outside of school. So that makes us question our priorities as societies. Why are we respecting the rights of people who contribute the most and uh, of whom we depend the most. And I think that's fundamental. Um, and I think that if there is any silver lining to all of this, is that COVID has brought us to such an absurd situation that we can no longer pretend that these inequalities don't exist. I think that more than ever, um, lack of knowledge and lack of awareness is an acceptable excuse for governments, for people, for the private sector to evade their responsibilities. And COVID ultimately is a call for action for all of us. We know what our issues are, where our issues are, and it's our moral and it's our legal responsibility to do something about it. So uh, that's how I see the relationship between COVID and human rights right now. Okay, well, since um, each of our um... Um, girls here talked, um, ladies here, <laughs> talked a little bit about their own countries. I'm still going to go back um, back to Natalia and then I'm going to go with Rai and Rosa. Um, and um, you mentioned a little bit already um, about this, but uh, we wanted to know a little bit um, specifically um, 
what uh, like the impact in COVID uh, of COVID for these um, for specific uh, these these groups specifically that are at risk. So um, especially at risk of um, human rights violations. So like the elderly women, or racial mi mi minority minorities. So how specifically do they get um, these human rights get violated in, in each in each of your, your countries? And I'm going to start with with Natalia. I think you talked a little bit more, but maybe give us a little bit more examples. Yeah, I think that all groups in Brazil who previously faced inequalities and discrimination are being disproportionately impacted by the pandemic in some way or another. And that includes many groups such as indigenous peoples in Brazil, such as people with disabilities, such as incarcerated persons, such as older persons. But uh, to deepen into two of those main groups, I think that women, for example, they have faced great risks and carried a large part of the burden of holding our society together right now. So, for example, if you ask yourself, who is caring for COVID patients? Health workers, 70% of whom are women. Who is caring for older persons who need that care and who are the most vulnerable right now? Caretakers, paid and unpaid, most of whom are women. Who is in period of isolation doing domestic chores and doing the most work caring for children who are outside of school? To a very large, disproportional and burdensome extent, women who already have made twice as much as men of unpaid care work before the pandemic. So uh, I, at the same time that women are contributing so much and they're doing uh, so much work, they are also profoundly disadvantaged. Women are more likely to be underpaid. They are more likely to be informal workers who just in the first month of the pandemic lost about 60% of their earnings and who are more vulnerable without social security protections. Women are more likely in many parts of the world, and I believe that applies to Brazil as well, to have lost their job during the pandemic. And they are very vulnerable, as well as Ray mentioned, to domestic violence, which has increased a lot in Brazil. And uh, underreporting increased as well because uh, they have less means to seek for help during isolation periods. And they're very much likely to die from that domestic violence. In Brazil, feminicides, 60% uh, of them happen within women's own homes. And um, feminicides in Brazil have grown, I believe they have increased about 22% during the pandemic. So women are at great risk in many, many ways. And uh, this is aggravated because women uh, have very low levels of political representation in Brazil. So we only occupy about 15% of the seats in Congress, which makes hard to advocate, it makes hard to participate in decision making concerning the policies that will affect women. So uh, that is very, very serious. And another group that is very seriously impacted is black people. Uh, when we look at the black population in Brazil, a large part of it is mostly in poor suburbs with inadequate housing, with inadequate sanitation and inadequate conditions in general. And about 80% of our black population relies solely on the national healthcare system, which has been impacted by austerity measures in the last few years. And in many places, it's collapsing because of COVID. So this has very serious consequences. And as usual, black lives are disproportionately at risk. So when you look at, for example, I've mentioned black people in Sao Paulo, they are four times more likely to die from COVID. Uh, when you look at feminicides, 60% of the women who are murdered are black women. So they are disproportionately at risk from uh, gender violence as well. When we look at favelas in Rio de Janeiro, where black people are the majority, uh, up to a month ago, they had more deaths than many Brazilian states. So uh, yeah. we see again that reality that I think COVID has exposed, which is that while some sectors in Brazil, you know, keep discussing if inequality is just or not, if it's desirable or not because of meritocracy, and these philosophical discussions happen in the comfort of their own privileges. And while all of that happens, the truth is that inequality defines not just how you live, but if you live or die. This is a very serious situation that we need to address right now. This is something urgent, uh, and inequality is, not, is something that we need to take more seriously. 
especially in the context of this pandemic. Yes, definitely. And I totally understand because I also live in Brazil and, and we see the news and it's really um, unbelievable. Um, I would like to give the word now to Rai. And um, Rai, if you could tell us a little bit um, how these um, um, groups at risk, how specifically um, their rights are violated. So uh, maybe a little bit, how is it in, in India? You spoke a little bit already, but uh, maybe give us more, a little some um, other examples. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think uh, one of the most uh, you know, potent examples would be that of the migrant workers, as I mentioned before, because mm -hmm. as the lockdown was announced, uh, many of our workers and 70 to 80 percent of workers in India, by the way, belong to the informal sector, wherein there is uh, no formal sort of guarantee of work, wherein they are often daily wage laborers who receive uh, wages on a day to day basis. They do not have social protection to a large extent and they do not have any kind of, you know, employers guaranteeing any kind of benefits to them. So in such a situation wherein 70 to 80 percent of the workforce belongs to uh, you know, the informal sector, the lockdown created a situation wherein they immediately had no income as soon as the lockdown was initiated because their jobs dried up in the span of a single day. And automatically with that, given that they had lack of savings or credit, they had to start, uh, you know, they had no other options. They could not afford the rent in the cities and there was a mass migration back from the urban to the rural areas. But what made it worse was the fact that uh, public transport was very largely cut off due to the lockdown because there was no public transport that was working. So there are uh, very tragic stories of hundreds of thousands of migrant workers actually walking hundreds of kilometers back to their home villages in order to be able to sort of survive because herein it became a situation of surviving the lockdown as opposed to surviving the pandemic. So that is one of the uh, major and the most potent examples of human rights violations. And there are very tragic stories, again, of many of these workers dying of starvation, of suicides, of police brutality, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is definitely an actress group that has uh, faced a very, uh, you know, a very large chunk of the human rights violations in the context of COVID in India. Apart from that, another group, as Natalia mentioned, is, of course, women in general. Uh, given that they form a bulk of the workforce that is working on the front lines, they are underpaid, they face, uh, continue to face various gendered uh, disadvantages. And apart from that, there has been a huge spike in domestic abuse cases in our country as well, as something that is being mirrored across the world. And uh, so women are definitely one of the at-risk populations. And what makes it worse is the underreporting. Because I was reading an uh, article somewhere where it said that it takes 50 instances of abuse to sort of uh, create the situation wherein uh, the victim, you know, reports an abuse, and that's an average number. So you can understand the sort of barriers, the socio, the social psychological barriers that exist between uh, abuse taking place and actually reporting it. And then the lockdown that is absolutely aspirated. So the women are the second category. Then is of course in India we have very diverse tribal communities. We have particularly vulnerable tribal groups of PVTGs. They have been uh, very uh, affected as well because the months in which the lockdown was imposed, which is March to June, is also the months wherein they collect the minor forest produce, which they sell mm -hmm. in the markets in the future. So automatically, uh, you know, because of the lockdown and the restrictions on movement, they have not been able to do that. And as a result of that, their incomes have also dwindled very significantly in a very specific manner. And uh, lastly, I'd like to end with the elderly. The elderly form 9% of our population. And about half of them, which is 53 million people, they uh, are, you know, they are very, very poor. So they lack social protection. They have now have restrictions on their mobility. They have financial insecurity. And on top of that, there is the entire, uh, you know, the, the mental health implications of loneliness and lack of social contact, which is created by this kind of pandemic. So the elderly are also at a very high risk of uh, health as well as mental health. So that's the four broad population groups that I can think about. Okay. Um, I would like to transfer the word now to Rosa. If you could tell us um, a little bit about how is it going in, in the US and uh, what are these populations at risk? What, what are specifically the violations they are suffering? You spoke a little bit to us um, previously uh, with your introduction. Uh, maybe you could give us a little bit some other examples. 
Thank you, Alisa. I think the situation in the United States has garnered an incredible amount of publicity lately due to its complexity, but also the different kinds of layers of the problems that we have at hand when it comes to COVID-19. And I think the first thing to highlight is that um, the United States is a country that has been affected by a very, very profound history and present of racial discrimination and inequality, uh, not only of racial, of all racial minorities, but inequality um, against many different groups of the population. And, um, and recently we have seen a lot of protests in the street. Um, there have been um, a lot of cries for reform of the police, for prevention of police brutality, for to discontinue this pattern of impunity when police killings occur, like the one that tragically occurred recently um, in the case of George Floyd. And the reason why I mention all of this is because when you think of COVID-19 and you analyze its impact in the United States, it's very difficult to disassociate what's happening with COVID-19 with this history of systemic and racial discrimination in the United States and this present of racial discrimination. So in terms of COVID-19, you do see African-American populations and also indigenous peoples very represented in those figures of those affected, but also those who have died from COVID-19. And we are also seeing um, very, very thorny and um, very difficult and formidable barriers to access health services, to access information, to be able uh, not only to prevent COVID-19, but also to treat COVID-19. Um, many of racial minorities in the United States are also affected by high levels of poverty, which is also another intersectional issue that really combines with that history of racial discrimination. And it does pose unique challenges when it comes to COVID-19. And I want to highlight another issue as well, that we have, we have transitioned into a virtual world. Basically, almost everything that we're doing um, at the moment is virtual because um, of COVID-19 and because of the restrictive measures um, that have been placed in most of the states in the United States. And the reality is that not every household has access to a computer. Not every household has access to internet um, or IT equipment or that virtual world. And this has a particular effect on racial minorities. And it does illustrate, as Natalia indicated and Rai indicated, that pattern of systemic inequality and how a crisis like this can really worsen um, a lot of the systemic inequality in a society. I want to say something in particular about women because women are not really a group in society. We're talking about more than half of the population. And women, as, as indicated by Natalia and Rai, they have been bearing the burden in many ways of COVID-19. Um, they bear the burden of child care, of caring for the sick. They compose a very significant component of the health workers or those frontline workers. Many women are affected by domestic violence and these orders of shelter in place definitely intensify that exposure of women to domestic violence and they don't necessarily have the resources available to be able to report incidents. And I think also um, one particular issue is the economic issue. I mean, the fact that a lot of women are part of that informal economy and they don't necessarily have the safety nets available to be able um, to have or meet basic, basic needs of themselves and also their families at this particular moment. I do think that decision-making issue is a big uh, challenge when it comes to um, groups at risk of the population. Um, the reality is that women and the other groups that I mentioned are not necessarily represented in decision-making structures in the United States. And that is definitely a very significant problem when it comes to addressing their needs. And I think there needs to be also more information, more statistics, more research, more guidance, more protocols of how to address specifically the needs of specific populations when you have an emergency of this magnitude. I mean, the reality is that this is a global emergency. It's not only an emergency related to the United States, and I do think we need uh, more proactive work, not only from the U.S. government, but the international community to produce research and information and guidance of how to best address the needs of these particular groups at risk. Yeah, you, you just pointed something very interesting, Rosa. Um, you, you just gave some uh, um, some things that, that we're getting into my next question, which would be some of the solutions that maybe these governments um, could give or that, you know, 
not just the governments in the US, but the governments uh, worldwide. Um, I was thinking, um, what do you think would be specific measures that you know the, the US government could take um, to help these um, populations at risk, especially these populations that are having um, their human rights so severely um, disrespected? And um, so um, what do you think could be some, some of the things or some things that are being done already and some of the things that maybe the, um, your government could do better? Um, you, can, you can speak in, you know, locally or globally, if you think, or maybe just you know, global. I, I think awareness, the basic awareness that there is a risk and that there's a specific and disproportionate impact is very key. I mean, the reality is that that awareness is not necessarily as widespread as we would like to see it. I think also the production of more information and research and statistics is very important. I think um, protocols in terms of treatment, in terms of access, in terms of how to guide the actions of different government entities, because we're talking about very different government entities here. I think that's very important as well. I do think that multilateralism and international cooperation in moments like this is fundamental and it's key. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, one of the biggest or largest points of concern that I have from the US government right now is that every day I see the government farther away from international cooperation. And I think this is a moment where international law is key, where um, everything that we know about the human rights law framework and all those obligations that states have assumed worldwide, including the United States, because the United States, it has ratified, you know, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, the Convention Against Torture. They are parties to some of the most important treaties. I do think it's important for the government to be closer to international law at the moment, to be closer to multilateralism at the moment, to be closer to international organizations, because I do think there's a great deal of very productive information um, that's been produced at the international level that I think could really be a benefit in the United States. And I do think that it's very, very important to see groups at risk um, know what the Senate um, in the decision making. There are presidential elections in the United States in November. And I think this is a very important moment, um, a very important historic moment in the United States. There's been protests for weeks um, yes. against racial discrimination. There's been more than 100,000 deaths related to COVID-19. And the reality is that I, I do hope all these issues come into play when it comes to electing the leadership of this country and when it comes to being um, a multidisciplinary response to the problems that we have right now with COVID-19, but with a human rights lens, you know, with a lens that's guided really by human dignity, against that's guided by the protection of the rights to life and personal integrity, and a lens that's guided more by those humane considerations and not so much about the need to reopen because of economic um, because of economic matters, you know, and not so much about what do we really need right now um, in terms of well-being of the population and those groups at risk. Yes, thank you. Um, I think those suggestions are actually um, really, really interesting. I really do hope they do um, take that into account when choosing um, your next leaders. We have even having some of the same problems here in Brazil as well. Um, I would like to um, give the word now to Rai. Um, Rai, if you could tell us maybe what are some of the things that your government is already doing um, to keep um, this, um, you know, these populations at risk um, from um, not getting their human rights, rights so much violated the way they are. And um, some of the things that you think in, that India is doing, and some of the things you think they could be that could be done more. You mentioned a lot about you know the, the workers and this great exodus that you had from you know um, let's say from the countryside to the city and from the city to the countryside without the public transport. That's a really big deal with you know um, you know breaking the rights of these people to have you know um, safety when going to work and and all of that. How do you think it could be better um, better addressed? And um, what are some of the things that you think India um, the Indian government is already doing yeah uh, so right now uh, ever since you know the lockdown was announced on 24th and I think three days later after that we had a relief package that was announced uh, wherein uh, transfers and cash and kind were provided to uh, various vulnerable pop populations in the rural and urban areas as per whichever category they belong to and apart from that there have also been other financial reforms wherein uh, you know incentives have been given to medium and small-sized enterprises as well 
But if I have to talk about it from a human rights perspective, then I think one of the things that the Indian government could have done better is provided better access to information to its citizens with regard to the lockdown, because the lockdown essentially was announced four hours before it actually came into practice, which left wow. many people very unprepared. Yeah, it left many people very unprepared as to you know what their next few days are going to be. And you can imagine that for a person whose daily uh, wages are, are dependent on the amount of work done on a particular day automatically, for him or her, the conditions are far more severe. So while India has done a very commendable job in creating awareness about the disease, about the precautions to be taken, about its threats, it hasn't done as much of a good job in terms of this, you know, speedy or accurate, uh, you know, the appropriate time in terms of announcing of a lockdown. That's number one. And the relief measures that finally came into place were three days after the lockdown was announced. There was a significant amount of uncertainty for a very large section of our population. So the right to information has to be very, uh, you know, clearly protected in such a situation. And that is not only pertaining to my country, but to every other country. So while countries can learn from India in terms of multi-channel uh, methods of spreading awareness about the disease, its precautions and threats, I think India should have perhaps announced it in a way in which people could have planned it better, thereby securing the right to information in a very free manner. That's the first point. And second thing that I think that economies around the world should be very vigilant about is about are not compromising about upon labor protection laws because uh with, with the reopening of economies uh there is often the tendency to sort of compromise on labor protection laws in many cases so as to attract business or so as to attract investment and uh you know sort of do away with some of the clauses which perhaps may not be as lucrative for an enterprise to set up which is something that's happening in some of the states in my own country wherein uh in, in certain cases facilities like a toilet or a water drinking uh, may be sort of compromised upon by state order so as to gain you know better access better investment in those areas so across the world there should be a very clear focus on never ever compromising on labor protection laws uh, as and when you know economies reopen and countries get back on track and everybody's in a rush to sort of make up the economic losses that they faced over the last few months but that should definitely be a very important thing so labor protection laws and right to information are something that I think would apply to uh, on a you know on a worldwide basis. But if India has to specifically think about its vulnerable people, uh, then I think the uh, cash transfer system is great because we are doing digitally linked uh, bank account transfers. But at the same time, the amount of transfers is not as adequate as one would assume because uh, you know it has not been sufficient. It, you know various economists and researchers have quoted that the amount of assistance provided is just not sufficient to cover the needs for very vulnerable sections of people who have lost their jobs. So increasing the coverage of these cash transfer programs, increasing the amount of the cash transfer program is something that should definitely be taken into consideration. And perhaps thinking of ways to retain migrant workers in cities rather than them undertaking that long journey to their villages should be seen, not just by way of providing free lunches and dinners, but by creating some employment opportunities of course, while taking into consideration the uh, social distancing norms. So in some way, we have the largest uh, public uh, works program in the world, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. But that applies mm -hmm. to rural areas. So perhaps if some version of that were to be applicable to urban areas, wherein every adult male or female is entitled to 100 days of employment at the minimum wage, then that would be very welcome. So two suggestions on an India level basis, increase the coverage and amount of the social assistance provided and ensure a mandrega for the urban areas. That's very, that's very interesting. I would like to, um, thank you for that, right? I would like to transfer the word now to Natalia. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit of what, well, I, <laughs> I'm Brazilian, so <laughs> I, I, I preemptively, preemptively get nervous about this question for you, but um, what is happening a little about what's happening a little bit in Brazil? What's our government um, doing for the people in our country, um, for at least um, people that are at risk and are having um, their human rights severely violated um, due to everything that the state is doing and what the state is not doing? So, um, if you could um, um, enlighten us a little bit about what's happening and what do you think um, could be done better, or maybe something that's not being done at all and could be done. Yeah, um, first of all, how long do you have? 
<laughs> so uh, we, we have many, many issues in Brazil, but uh, I, I agree completely with uh, Professor Rosa and Rai. I think that many issues that are happening right now in the US and India, we are sharing in Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. But to uh, focus on one main thing that we sometimes take for granted and that appears very basic, but uh, we're not having, I think Brazil's main issue right now regarding COVID is the absence of a clear policy, one that is uh, federal, one that is uh, based on science, one that is focused on the rights of persons. Uh, because since the beginning of the pandemic, the Bolsonaro administration has denied the existence of the pandemic and has denied its effects. Uh, he has publicly spoken up against social distancing and tried to undermine it. Um, so we have had a very weird situation in which he went, for example, to unsafe public appearances. Uh, which he and his supporters attended without a mask to encourage people to actually go out to the streets and live their lives in business as usual mode, as if nothing was happening. So uh, I, I think we still need the basic. We need a clear federal policy because it was left for some local and state governments to address these issues uh, without any kind of federal coordination and in actually in opposition to the federal government. And we are witnessing the results of, of these choices. So, for example, we uh, just had more than a million cases of COVID in Brazil. We have reached more than 50,000 deaths. Uh, in many places, our healthcare system is collapsing. There are no ICUs, so people are dying because there are no places in hospitals. And the economy is still in bad shape, even though the Bolsonaro government did all of this, actually in the name of the economy uh, or the economic elite. So uh, this is something very, very concerning. And even though the cases and that they, they keep rising and we haven't reached the peak yet. Many places uh, that had adopted some social distancing policies uh, during this time are for some reason opening up without you know no justification. Cases are still rising. We have a collapsed healthcare system and people are opening the economy up and you know telling people to go back to normal. And that is absurd and, and that is completely unacceptable. So I think the main thing in Brazil is actually going back to basics, is actually having a policy, is actually taking this serious. Uh, and uh, considering science, you know, in, in, in developing those policies and uh, not just prioritizing, you know, the interest of the private sector and actually prioritizing Brazilian citizens. So I think that's the main thing. Uh, and also in correlation to that, we could talk about many things, but for example, the only actual restriction that Bolsonaro government made was not a restriction of social contact, was a restriction of information. So uh, last month, for example, uh, the Bolsonaro government uh, closed a COVID website that had detailed information on COVID and the evolution of cases in Brazil. So uh, people are actually being denied very basic information and it's been done to cover all of this up. And this is just completely revolting for any Brazilian to talk about. Uh, and in doing so, the health ministry actually said that local governments were inflating, they were over-reporting over the numbers to get more financial resources when research has demonstrated that in fact, numbers have been under-reported. So this is very serious and I think that uh, Brazil lacks a commitment to science, it lacks a commitment to people and uh, we, need to talk about many things, for example, the rights of informal workers and, and all these situations. But the first thing that we need to do is actually have a policy. So uh, that's what I would like to highlight the most about Brazil. I, I totally agree with, I agree with you. And I also agree that we do share a lot of the problems that you know US and India are having. Um, I would like to go for a last question before we um, go to see um, what our spectators might be asking. Um, and it is a question about something that um, Rosa, Rai, and Natalia talked a lot about. And since, you know, this um, this year, 
the international social conference conference is focusing on women um we you talked a lot about how um, um COVID-19 has been impacting women um, with, you know, um, um, domestic violence and everything. So um, COVID and um, the related need for everybody to stay at home has certainly led to an increase in domestic violence. And um, that is proved in numbers and everything. So how do you think, um, I'm going to start first with Natalia, how do you think that advocates can best advocate for those affected um, by domestic violence and other human rights um, violations at a time when everyone is getting told to stay at home? How, how do we help um, specifically these, these women? How can the government, how can advocates help um, these women that are having um, these um, serious problems with um, domestic violence? And it has increased so much. And it's um, something that um, many women um, go through. And I think they go through it in Brazil and India and the US. And, um, probably everywhere around the world and how like rosa said we are not a minor minority we are part of the population we're like more than half of the population of the world so how can we um, um try to solve this uh i think it's a very complicated problem it's a very serious one particularly in brazil we are the country with the fifth highest rates of minicides in the world uh and we have been watching a very serious increase in domestic violence that was actually accompanied by uh, an increase in under-reporting of domestic violence during the pandemic. So I think that's, first of all, where we should start. We need to fight this under-reporting. We need to provide, first of all, awareness for women to recognize when they are living in abusive contexts. We need to give them safe, safe spaces uh, in which they can search for help. You know, those safe spaces can be online. They can be in the supermarkets they go. They can be in the pharmacies. They can involve a signal that these women can use to let people know that they're facing violence. But uh, especially in a context where women are mainly isolated at home, we need to think about how to help them search for help. And this is fundamental. And the second thing, I think we need to raise awareness of the public in general, because it takes a community to fight domestic violence. You know, especially in the situation that we are right now, neighbors need to be aware that if they have suspicions of domestic violence, they need to report this and they need to report this immediately. Uh, that is very concerning. And we also need to look at our personal obligations, you know, check up on our friends and, you know, try to support each other because that's what we can do right now. And I think that, you know, after violence has been reported, we need quick and effective responsive systems. We need ways to make sure that protection measures are being implemented right away, that, you know, these women are not staying locked at home with their aggressor after these reports are made. This is completely unacceptable. And that involves adapting procedures. So, for example, some procedures might need to be rebuilt. Some procedures might need a visit at the woman's home to be carried. Um, so this is profoundly necessary, adapting our procedures in, in this case. Uh, and, of course, we need infrastructure to do that. You know, I think that... Um, about about nine ninety percent of Brazilian cities don't have uh, a police station focused on the women, which is responsible wow. for for this uh, for accompanying this domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, that after that and after these protection measures, we need social economic support. So uh, this uh, last year, the Superior Court of Justice in Brazil denied that women who are victims of domestic violence are entitled to paid leave in their work. But uh, we need to extend social protection measures to beyond formal women who are now employed, especially because so many women are informally employed or are outside of their jobs right now. So uh, we actually need to provide social protection measures for them to be able to care for themselves, to care for their families and their children. 
uh, women also need safe spaces to go to, you know, to uh, live in. So that will require assistance from the state as well. And safe housing in which they are both safe from their aggressor and safe from COVID. So uh, I don't think there is a simple solution and a clear one when it comes to domestic violence in Brazil. But we do need to think systemically uh, to all the, the steps in this protection processes and enhance them and adapt them to our current situation. And I think that we need uh, more gender sensitive policies as well to help in that. And we need socioeconomic support. Women cannot survive in this context, in the context of violence and COVID without socioeconomic support. So uh, we need to address this very much now, you know, immediately. This is very, very urgent. Yes, I agree with you. Thank you for your response. I would like to give the word now to Rai and then to Rosa. Um, Rai, what are some of the things you think the, um, the Indian government could be doing um, for these um, 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 women um, that are vulnerable and um, that are suffering domestic violence. I mean, now, what are some of the things, you know, not just the government, but activists and how can people um, help these women? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as Natalia pointed out, you know, domestic abuse is, assist, you know, requires systemic solutions. And with the pandemic and with lockdowns right now, you know, we have 90 countries almost in various stages of lockdown. So there are obviously opportunities for women to be at home wherein they are at home with their abuse and are facing uh, a crisis. And what makes it even worse is that one out of four countries don't have any laws which are, are you know, addressing domestic violence. So I think at one level, it perhaps requires a recognition of this problem and then a sort of path to provide effective justice, as Natalia pointed out when as and when you know reporting takes place so uh, th at one level it's that legislative provision that there is uh, the law that will protect you against domestic violence in countries wherein it is uh, not present or is ineffectively implemented apart from that i really like that natalia's emphasis on safe spaces and safe accommodation which is very very important and uh, while that is very important i would also like to emphasize on the point that getting to the safe space is the problem often Travel is the problem. And when you're talking about a lockdown or a restricted uh, mobility, then that is even worse. So perhaps one thing that I can think on the top of my head is that the government can partner with perhaps private uh, taxi uh, so, or service firms, let's say like an Uber or an Ola to provide emergency services so that certain victims can be taken away from their homes to a safe space. So that if that commute is sort of strengthened and facilitated from the government side in partnership with a private firm, then that would definitely strengthen, you know, a, a victim's access to a safe space. So perhaps that could uh, be one thing that could be thought of. Apart from that, of course, ways in which underreporting can be combated. There has to be a multi-channel way in which uh, domestic abuse is talked about, is discussed, whether it be on the television ads, whether it be through posters, whether it be through the online or digital media. And the government can definitely make a very concerted effort in explaining exactly, very explicitly what domestic abuse consists of and ways of seeking help through whether it be a helpline number or a WhatsApp group or any kind of other measure. So creating that awareness at a very basic level and creating that sort of safe space, even from the government side, that it's OK to come out and report. And it is a uh, something that has to be normalized. Normalizing reporting is the next thing that I would definitely like to emphasize upon. And yes. not only for women, there are a lot of children who are also stuck home with their abusers. And in India, we have a very uh, stringent child protection laws as well. Uh, and we have uh, schemes that particularly pertain to children in you know in particular. So again, flashing that online num the helpline number over and over again, creating scenarios through ads or whatever about how important it is to report. All of these are very important factors in creating that awareness and therefore creating that normalcy around reporting. So that's the second thing. And apart from that, of course, it's about uh, partnering with uh, you know, CSO, civil society organizations or NGOs. So creating that network wherein the suppose the government, let's say, funds them, the CSOs check on certain women who may have reported uh, you know, violence in the past. So creating that on ground network and creating it through a multidisciplinary approach is the third thing. So these are just some of the suggestions that I can think about on the top of my head. Yes, and they're really good suggestions. Thank you, right? Especially because it's, it is such a taboo, right? That people don't really talk about it. Um, I'm going to ask for the word now to Rosa. 
um, and Rosa, what are some of the things, um, I think, you know, Natalia and Ray said a lot of um, really great suggestions. Uh, what are some of the suggestions maybe you can think of, you know, that the government um, can do or maybe even NGOs um, for this um, crisis that we are living right now during this um, huge pandemic? And um, what are some of the ways you think that could be solved um, maybe in the US or even worldwide? Rosa, I think you're muted. Sorry to interrupt you, but I, I'm, I'm not hearing you. I wasn't supposed, I, I don't know if it was my it was my computer or yours. Did you hear me now? Yes, I do. Okay, okay. wonderful, wonderful. Could you, so could I, you I, over, please? Of course. <laughs> so I just wanted to support what Natalia and Rice said about, um, about domestic violence victims and the different options available. I think one of one one aspect in particular that I think is very important, especially in a country like the United States, is that there has to be from the government side um, a way to ensure that there's an access to resources, especially reporting resources to victims of domestic violence, even in this particular moment in time, even with the changes, even with the fact that we have transitioned into a virtual world. So that means access to, um, to ways of reporting that are not only by telephone, but also online, for example. Um, the fact that helplines need to continue operating, the fact that victims have to be able to seek protection orders when they need them, the fact that shelters need to be able to be open um, and operating at this particular time um, and other resources. I think part of the problem with COVID-19 is that we have entered into a moment in time where it seems that all the information that we're getting from the government and from society in general is about how to address COVID-19, but not necessarily how to continue addressing all these other challenges that we have as societies, right? And domestic violence is, is an ongoing issue. It's not gonna, it, it doesn't stop because we are at home. It doesn't stop because we have transitioned into this virtual world and we have closed our businesses and schools to the country. It can intensify. And I think that access to those resources and ensuring continuity is very important. But I also think training of government officials of how to address domestic violence at this particular moment in time is very important as well. I think a lot of government officials are operating in different ways at the moment. Our justice system is certainly not operating in the same way. And I think that there has to be an, an awareness um, from government officials of how to address ongoing problems like this one, even in a virtual world. I mean, even in a world where we're not operating um, as usual. And um, I also want to end by sending a message to all of hope and 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 positive thinking. I think there's many ways in which and many strategies that we can address, that we can employ to actually address the complexity of the problems that we have been discussing today. They're very big challenges, but I do think that there's a lot that we can do to address them as well. And I also send all a, a, a very important message of health and wellness right now. Um, I know many of you are at home right now. Your life has completely changed. And I just want to send you a lot of solidarity at this particular moment. Thank you so much, Rosa. Um, I would like, unfortunately, we won't have more time to address any other questions. Um, thank you so much for um, the people that are watching. And I would like to um, um, thank you so, so much, Rosa, Rai, and Natalia. Um, you ladies brought um, so much information and, and so many things that we needed to think about. And I just really wish this video gets um, to be seen by some of our governments and maybe uh, we can, um, you know, together with NGOs and with a lot of people address all these issues and try just to make a, a better world. Um, thank you for participating in this live. It was an honor to be here and to listen to you and to interview you, um, even though I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> But um, just thank you so much. I hope you stay safe, you stay home, and um, that we can all, you know, get better soon with everything that's going on. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.